Teach us that we know how to behave ourselves when we come in the household of God. Yes, Lord. Father, teach us not to be uh, so arrogant with our spirit and how we treat one another. Yes. As we look towards one another, we need you, Father, to guide our steps. Because the best that we might think of ourselves, we still need a Father yes. to guide us. Yes. All of the things that we have accomplished in our lives, uh, the education that we have achieved, uh, the homes that we have, the cars that we drive, the children that we raise, the air that we breathe, the food that we take, yes. and the substance that we eat, all comes through your mercy and your grace. Yes. Father, we thank you for the humble spirits that prevail here at this particular location. Yes. And sometimes we don't successfully produce that spirit in the presence of everyone. Father, let us be mindful that everyone in this house is important to you. Yes. That we don't have no big eyes and little you. Amen. Help yes. us to learn how to humble ourselves in the presence of everyone. Yes. That we might show love fervently yes. and gen genuinely and sincerely. Yes. We thank you for our minister that labors here to teach the, group, the, the word of God to us. That we might understand perfectly your will. We thank you for his wife that serve you, Father. Amen and help him as he yeah. needs a help me. Yeah. We thank you, Father, for each person that's married here, each person that's single. All of us are your true. Yeah. Help yeah. us, Father, to humble our hearts and our spirits and not think so much highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Yeah. But all that we need is you, Father, yeah. to guide our steps, to guide our tongues, because, Father, some of us don't know what to say and how to say things to one another. Yeah. We think things are cute, but they're not cute. We think, Father, that the best that we can say sometimes we don't accomplish yes. the best of us when we try to communicate our thoughts with one another. Yes. Now, the older we get, we tend to lean on the misunderstanding that the appropriate things that we can say that is not said that we got on the wrong side of the bed and Amen. we didn't think before we spoke and Amen. all of these Amen. things that we try to make excuses for not being the children that you yes. want us to be. Father, help us to be mindful of our responsibility and let our light so shine yes. that we might glorify you, yes. Father. And we ask this prayer in your Son's most holy and precious name. We give the glory and praise. Amen. 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 <coughs> Let's notice page uh, sixty-three. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. Read. 
to someone else? Huh? Right. Are you able to take people uh, chapter and verse through the Bible and show them that Jesus is the Messiah, Amen. that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Christ? If not, then take notes and make sure that you put this under your belt because it's going to give you an opportunity to share Christ with others. But at the same time, it's going to reinforce your faith when all is said and done. You're going to be stronger when you come out of here as a seasoned Christian. So I encourage you, let's go back to Genesis chapter 49, verse number 10. We're going to be all over the Old Testament showing the world that Jesus is the Son of God. He's always been the plan since day one for our salvation. And we're going to march through the Old Testament like we did a few weeks ago. But these are going to be some different scriptures to show you that from Genesis to Malachi, God has always planned to send Jesus for our salvation. And only Jesus was the one being sent for our salvation. I know that it's not an easy way of saying it, but the truth is the truth. We have to understand that the truth of Jesus is in competition with Judaism. The truth of Jesus is in competition with Islam. The truth of Jesus is in competition with atheism. But what we're going to show you is that, yes, all these things are well-crafted lies, but there's only one truth. And we're going to find out what that one truth is by what God says, no matter what a Ph.D. may be saying. No matter what a man that's been preaching for 40 years but still wrong is saying. What God says goes, and that's going to be the only thing that's going to save us in the end. So what we're going to present is what God says and what God says only. So with that being said, let's get going on Genesis 49, verse number 10. Let me go ahead and reread it again for my own purposes and to remind you. All right, let's look at Genesis 49, verse number 10. The Bible says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Let me read one more time. Genesis 49, verse number 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and until him shall the gathering of the people be. So our overall thought that we're going to demonstrate from the scriptures is simply, it has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus. You're going to find out what that means in just a moment. But as always, we can trace Jesus in the Old Testament. The Old Testament constantly mis mentioned the coming of Jesus in prophecy. Again, prophecy is very simply God foretold before these events happened that they were going to happen. In other words, the Old Testament was a preview of the New Testament. The Old Testament was always screaming, you need a Savior. And the New Testament screamed back, well, he has come. And his name is Jesus Christ. If you study the Old Testament, and I mean the New Testament, especially things like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's always referring back to the Old Testament. In other words, it will present something about Jesus that said this was what was written. And that means that we're going back to the Old Testament showing you that Jesus was the ultimate and only and initial plan of God from the very beginning to save all of mankind. So again, prophecy means God foretold what would happen centuries before it did. So that also gives us confidence. Mean that we know that if these things were said hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Jesus could not fake these things. Amen. That is, he was literally the fulfillment of these things in all honesty, in all integrity. Things that weren't even in his own control. These things were foretold about him. You'll see exactly what I mean as we go along in the message. So let's look at this again. Uh, Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 10 there. Let's go back. Now, let's go back to that scripture. Let's put it back on the screen. Look what the Bible says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now, scepter means a staff. It means the symbolic authority of a king. So God is saying hundreds of years before Jesus came that, that the scepter, meaning the staff, a kingship, would not leave Judah 
until Shiloh come. In other words, what he was saying is there's going to come one day when the Jews no longer have a king. This means, like for instance, when they were under Jesus' ministry, when he walked on this earth, there was no longer a King David. There was no longer a Solomon. There was no longer a Rehoboam or any other type of king that literally sat on a throne at the time when the Messiah, I mean the Savior, was to come. So in other words, there was a specific time in history when the same Savior was supposed to show up. And so obviously then, king after king had to come and die, and then finally they had to be taken over by a foreign nation called Rome that, that made sure they had no king that was Jewish. And so that's what this is saying. God was saying a long time ago, I'm going to strip the nation of, uh, of Jerusalem, the nation of the Jews, of all their kings, and then you're going to find the real king. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. I'm going to take away man-made kings. I'm going to give you the king of heaven. Amen. It's going to literally come down and rule over his people. Amen. And this is what he's saying. He see, called him what? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until what? Shiloh. Shiloh is another title for what? The Messiah. The Son of God, the Lord and Savior, who we obviously acknowledge later to be who? Jesus of Nazareth. Right. So until Shiloh come, and until him shall be what? The gathering of the people. So you already saw that God saw right in the beginning and foretold us that the true king was coming. And his name would be Shiloh. So again... We know that this is a fact because all you got to do is go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse number 1. Luke chapter 3, verse number 1. You're going to find in those passages of Scripture that the Jews had no true king over them anymore. The Bible says what? They even admitted it themselves that Caesar was their king. Y'all remember that? When they were trying to get Jesus crucified, what did the audience say unto them? He said, we have no king. But Caesar. And they told the truth. They had no secular king at that time except for Caesar, who was Roman. Not what? Jewish. Right? And so that shows you that Jesus showed up when? At the right time. So that's more evidence that he's what? The son of Oh God, oh amen, somebody. That's why you can't have nobody set, set, uh, uh, showing up nowadays. I'm Jesus, or are you? Huh? Were you born in Bethlehem? Huh? Can you walk on water? Huh? Well, let's show, let me see that one, right? See, we're going to have to have the folks in the, in the jackets, right? In order to save him, because why? He ain't nothing but a liar, right? Oh, amen, somebody. There's one specifically, and it has to be who? It has to be Jesus. Oh, amen, somebody. Now, so obviously then, what is the chance of that happening without the divine intelligence of the Lord making it happen? Yes, sir. You got to see how powerful the Father is. You got to see how powerful the Holy Spirit is. He made sure Jesus showed up at the right time in order to fulfill what? Genesis 49. Verse number 10. Oh, isn't that beautiful, y'all? That's the power of God. And also what reinforces your faith that you believe in the right God. Yes, and I'm going to show you that uh, even further as we go on. Y'all to be excited about this this morning yes. because you're believing on the right person. Amen. Because Amen. nobody else fulfill these prophecies but Jesus. Amen. Not Muhammad, not none of them rascals. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. Only Jesus. Amen. Oh, amen. Now, let's move on then. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. Another prophecy that revealed the divine status of Jesus being the Son of God is contained in these words. Let's look at that for a minute. Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. The Bible says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and what? Bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. So remember Isaiah also lived hundreds of years before Jesus was born in that manger. 
in Bethlehem. So God is working through uh, Isaiah and showing you, giving you a sign, giving you something to show you that Jesus is the right guy. And he never knew Jesus. Amen. Oh, amen. This was just God moving his heart. Yeah. He never laid eyes on Jesus. Oh, amen. Yeah. I'm talking about in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. He never did. So he could not have faith this one either. Oh, amen. Now, yeah. this had to be what? Divinely inspired to come out of a man's mouth that lived hundreds of years before Jesus showed up. So let's look at this for a minute and see if this does fit the profile of Jesus. The Bible says again, therefore the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a what? A virgin shall conceive. Mm -hmm. Now, no disrespect to anybody in here, but I don't know no virgins that ever had a baby. Well, oh, amen, somebody. Amen. It usually takes two to tango, don't it? Yeah. Huh? But the Bible said a special woman would come forward. And she would be able to have a child without a man being involved, period. Yeah. Oh, amen. Now, you know, the scientific community would be jumping all over that. How did this happen? They will be analyzing her DNA. How many chromosomes she got, huh? Does she have XX? Does she got XXX? You know, they do all kind of crazy stuff. In order to try to figure out how this woman had a baby without anybody being involved. Huh? Well, we already been told. The Bible says what? That the Holy Ghost is going to cause this to conceive, which is what? God. Huh? And so obviously then, this was the sign that, a, that the Messiah, meaning the Savior, the Son of God, will be born. This is how you identify him as the Son of God on top of all the things that we have already talked about. So obviously then, the virgin was a sign from God. It had to be a miraculous birth. It was a birth through the literal virgin womb of a woman. In other words, Mary, Jesus' mother, never had sex with any man in order to conceive Jesus. Amen. Instead, his birth is the only birth to come through a virgin woman. Yeah. He is literally the son of God because God miraculously impregnated his earthly mother as the New Testament will verify. Hundreds of years later in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, and Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to verse number 38. So again, I have to challenge you with the words. It has to be who? It has to be Jesus. You see, another prophecy. Let me show you something real powerful. When you go over to Psalm chapter number 22, verse 7 to verse number 17, this is one of the scriptures way back, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, that talked about him being crucified before it ever happened. Y'all didn't know the Old Testament had the crucifixion in it too? Yes, it did. Oh, amen, somebody. Let's look at it for a minute. Out of the uh, New International Version, just for clarity. Let's read it for a minute. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 22, verse 7 to verse number 17. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Sound like Jesus on the cross, right? right? Sounds like somebody was making fun of him when he was on the cross, which they certainly did. Look what it says in verse number 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he what? Delights in him. Let's look at the next verse. Verse number nine. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Verse 11 says, do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Tell me how many people helped Jesus. Not a one, did they? When he was in the garden, what did everybody say before he got here? Well, brother, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus, I got your back. Can I paraphrase it? But when the arrest went down, where were they? Nowhere to be found. Oh, amen, somebody. Look what he says also, going back to the cross in, in prophecy. In verse number 12, he says, many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. That's the description of his enemies. Look what it says in verse 13. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. Verse 14 says, now this is where it gets sad to me. This is where the emotions start welling up. Because he's talking about how it felt when he was on the cross. Oh, amen, somebody. He's talking about his agony at this time. 
He's talking about how bad it hurts to be on a cross. Look what he says. I am poured out like water. What he's saying, folks, this is deep. He said, I can feel the life start to leak out of my body. Oh, amen, somebody. He says, and all my joint bones are out of joint. Yeah. You ever dislocated anything? Oh, yeah. Imagine dislocating everything. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. You can't even imagine how much pain that is. Yeah. That really was. He said, and all my joints, are, I mean, all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. Sorrow, guys. Sorrow. He's hurting emotionally and physically at the same time. Look what he says in verse 15. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, like a uh, pottery. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. He can feel the closing moments. And on top of that now, not only is he hurting physically and emotionally, look what he's looking at. This is what he's looking at. He's talking about his enemies in verse 16. He says what? Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. What do they do to you, Lord? He said it. Now, you can't deny this being a crucifixion at all. Look what he says. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, remember, this was written centuries before it happened. This is God revealing the mind of Jesus to you. While he hung on the cross of Calvary. He says, all my bones are on display. When you, when you stretched out, you can see everything in you. Huh? He says, all my bones are on display. People stare and what? Gloat over me. Oh, amen, somebody. Isn't that ugly? Isn't that ugly what Jesus had to go through, but he went through it for you. Do you realize? He knew all this stuff before it was going to happen. Yeah. Now you understand the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane where it said that sweat like blood drops was coming off of him because he knew exactly Amen. what was going to happen Amen. to him. He knew that he was about to go through this nailing in his hands and his feet. He knew he was going to be circled around folks and they were going to try to uh, humiliate him. Yeah. He knew that all his bones were going to feel like they were out of joint at the same time. He knew he was going to be able to feel what it feels like for death not to move out of you fast, but to what? Slowly. Yes, sir. In other words, it's torture. Right, man. Huh? He knew all that, and he still went through it because he said, greater love have no man than this. Oh, amen, somebody. Right, man. Got a man lay down his what? Life for his what? Friends, don't nobody have your back like Jesus. Amen. Knowing that this was going to happen to him, huh? This is worse than a man going to jail for you. This is worse than somebody taking 25 to life for you, huh? Because this was agony and torture that nobody could survive, huh? And he knew it, eyes wide open going into it, that this is what I must do to save every last one of you. And I'm going to do it. At my own expense. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. You can't get no more powerful love amen. than that. So this passage of scripture, going back to Psalm 22, verse 7 to verse number 17, is a powerful but sad description of the crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah. Again, it foretells, I want to highlight it really quickly so it sticks with you. It foretells these enemies mocking him with insults as he was nailed to that cross. Yes, it even foretells the tremendous pain the Lord experienced during his crucifixion. Yeah. And it also in detailed and graphic language showing him being pierced with nails in his hands and his feet. Right. We know this was a literal nail into the cross as described in the New Testament when the resurrected Jesus came to the disciples and showed them, John 20 verse 19 and verse 31 the prints of, his, uh, of the nails in his hands and his feet. Wasn't that beautiful? You know, he came back and wasn't nothing healed, y'all. Y'all realize that. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, all this stuff was still open. Huh? It still was able for Doubt and Thomas to be able to what? Put his hands in his wounds. Oh, amen, somebody. Let's show you that his body was what? Resurrected in the body state. And then, not until 40 days later, did it arise. 
unto eternity. Right. Immortality where he's trying to take us at the same time. So all this stuff was literal. The reason why I say that may sound elementary to you, but some people say that Jesus never went to the cross. Amen. Huh? Some people say that God switched him with somebody else. All kind of nonsense. That's Islam. Hmm? But that don't jive with what the Bible said, do it? Huh? Because Jesus said, I feel stuff leaving me. All my bones are out of joint. That ain't no imposter on the cross. That's the one. That it has to be what? Jesus. Oh, amen, somebody. Some folks that called themselves Christians long ago, Gnostics, they call them. They said, well, Jesus, God would have never put his son up there. Yes, he did. Because he did what? He gave him as a sacrifice for what? Us. Oh, amen, somebody. That was just a spirit up there. How a spirit going to have nails in his hands? And his feet. Huh? Any spirits I ever hear of in science or whatever you want to call it, you go right through them. So how is a nail go through his hands and his feet? I chuckle because it's silly. You got to be able to march through the Bible yourself so you don't get fooled by this nonsense. That's leading millions of people, if not billions, astray. Oh, amen, somebody. All I got to do is stay on track by staying in the Bible and leave everything else alone. Yes, sir. Go by the Bible without opinion, and you'll get it right. Yes. See, even more amazing is the foretelling of the gambling the soldiers would do in order to see who would receive the crucified Jesus' clothes. Also mentioned in Psalm chapter 22, verse number 18. Again, this gambling of the Lord's clothing was literally done and described in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 27, verse number 35, this is further proof that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You see, Jesus could not have made men gamble for his clothes. They chose to do this on their own. Let's move on again to Psalm chapter 16, verse number 8 to verse number 11, as we continue to march through the Old Testament in prophecy to show you that Jesus is the Son of God, that it has to be Jesus. Look what the Bible says. Now, this is the mind of Jesus again. This is hundreds of years before he was born once again. Look at Psalm 16, verse 8 to verse 11. Again, out of the NIV version says, Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will what? Rest secure. Why is he going to rest secure, Jesus? He's talking about dying now, y'all. He's talking about his death at this point. Because what? You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faith in one what? See? Decay. Folks, he's saying that the death and resurrection of Jesus was foretold that happened hundreds of years before he was even born. Look what he says in verse number 11. 11. He says, you make known to me the path of life. In other words, when I'm in the tomb, you're going to show me how to get out. Oh, that's powerful. You're going to show me how to get out of the tomb. Not only will you do that, you're going to what? You will fill me with joy in your presence. In other words, I'm going to come back to heaven yeah. where I started from. Amen. Oh, amen. That's what Jesus is saying. Amen. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your what? Right hand. Not only am I going to heaven, I'm going to sit at your right hand, the place of approval. Huh? Remember, don't you want to be on the right hand and not the left hand? Amen. When you go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, judgment day, don't you want to be a sheep on the right hand? Right. Oh, amen. amen. And not a goat on the left hand? Amen. It's the place of what? Of proof. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. So obviously then, he knew that it was worth dying. First, because why? It would save us. Amen. But also it would give him a chance to be reunited with his father. And he shows us, look at this. He says, in your present, there's eternal uh, pleasures at your right hand. In other words, he knew that giving up this body would give him better than what he started with. The same thing happens with us. When we're on the right hand of God, John 14, verse 1 and verse 2 applies to us, doesn't it? Doesn't it say that, uh, let not your heart be troubled? You believe in God, believe also in me and my father's house of many mansions. If the Lord of that soul would have told you, I do what, church? Go to prepare a place for you. That's at the what? The right hand of God. Oh, amen. But you see, right got to be right. What I mean by that, you got to be right. 
Savior. You got to have the right Savior. You got to have the right Savior. The right Savior. You got to have the right faith. Huh? And you got to have the right obedience. Amen. In order to get there. Oh, amen, somebody. When you shake a man's hand, you start with the right hand. He's supposed to give you what? His right hand, right? Amen. Right is right. And right go together. Amen. If not, something wrong, right? Oh, amen. Come on now. How many of you want to wear two left shoes? <laughs> that going to get you wear very fast. Amen. When all this said and done. So obviously then, let's go back to Psalm 16, verse 8, verse 11. Make sure I don't miss anything here. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my what? Right hand. Now, right is right, ain't it? Right. Huh? If you want to be at the right hand of God, you got to keep God at what? Your right hand, right? right. Meaning what? The place of approval. The place of exaltation. In other words, you place him on high, right? Your relationship is maintained when God is your right hand. Oh, amen. So obviously then, Jesus is showing us the same thing. So this is what he went through in life. In order to accomplish the faith and obedience, he needed to get back to the Father as an example for you and I. Look at verse 8 again. It says, I have set the Lord always before me. Meaning he never took his eyes off God, right? As we are never to take it off of the Father either. Because why? He is at my right hand. I will not be what? Shaken or moved in other, uh, other uh, uh, translations. Now, that's saying some deep stuff to us as Christians, right? When God is on your right hand, you won't be shaken. Huh? When God is on your right hand, cancer don't scare you like it would if he wasn't there. Amen. But again, what is Jesus doing? Actively what? Keeping God at his right hand. Huh? You see, when you have God at your right hand, you're not so much worried about layoffs. Amen. Huh? Oh, amen. No. You're not worried about some relationship stuff. That stuff becomes what? Secondary. And God keeps you from what? Being shaken. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But you have to do your part, right? And keep him at the what? Right, right hand. hand. See, when you don't have him at the right hand, he's actually behind you. Right. Huh? And how much shielding can a person do behind you? Yeah. Right. No. Don't work that way, right? right? It don't. So you're going to be shaken up by everything that blow your way. Yeah. Huh? When you ain't attending, amen, I'm talking amen. that. Amen. God is at your right hand. Amen. Huh? When you ain't praying, God is at your right hand, huh? When that's studying your word, God is not what? At your right hand. So what's gonna happen to you? You gonna be sure. Amen. That's the truth, y'all. In other words, how do you keep from getting shaken? How do you keep from losing it? How do you stay in the faith? Keep your eyes always on the Lord, right? And keep him at what? Your right hand. Hey, oh, amen. Come on now. I hope you understand what the word of God is saying. You have to do your part to keep from being shook. Oh, amen, somebody. So it says, I have set the Lord all the way before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is what? Huh? You catch that? Therefore, my heart is what? When God is at your right hand, what are you? Depressed? Didn't say that, did he? Are you fearful? No. Huh? Are you downtrodden? No. No. What did Jesus say? He says, I have kept you, Father, on my right hand. Now I'm what? I'm glad. Right. And how can he maintain being glad through all he went through? Because of the power of God. Amen. Oh, amen. amen. You see, when you're fighting stuff that's behind you, you need supernatural help yeah. in order to make that happen. Yeah. And that's what's going on. Right now, oh, amen, somebody. You see, now, let's move on from that then. He says, therefore, my heart is glad in my what? My tongue complains. Huh? He said, what? My tongue what? Rejoices. My body also will what? Rest secure. In other words, you got my body intact. You got it all in your hands. I know you're going to make it rise again. That's what Jesus is saying. Look what he said in verse number 10. That's exactly what's being said. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your what? Holy one see decay. So obviously then, that's a prophecy that what? In order to be the son of God, he had to rise from the dead. Huh? That was the sign that showed you that he is the son of God. Again, verse 11 says, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your what? Your right 
hands. So again, the scripture is establishing hundreds of years before Jesus was born that the Son of God, the sign of him being of such, is that he would die and rise from the dead. You see, folks, Jesus literally did that after being three days in the grave. You see that in Matthew chapter 27 and verse, uh, in Matthew 27 and chapter 28 as well. He could not have faked his death. This is what's so powerful. When you look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 60, there were guards around his tomb. And guess who put them there? His enemies. The Jews set the guard. Oh, amen now. And so there's no way in the world he could have faked that, right? I would see that if he'd have placed all the apostles there, then somebody could have whispered in the ear, now Peter, when everybody go away, now real quiet, get the crowbar out. I don't know if they had one back then. I'm just talking about this today, right? Pride, pull it back. Huh? Make sure you kick the dust so it don't look like nobody's feet is there. Oh, amen. Come on now. Then I'm going to come on out. And y'all hide me somewhere. Guess what? That didn't happen. Because Peter wasn't there. Huh? He and the rest of the apostles ran. They feared for their what? Their lives. The only one there was the crucifixion was John. Huh? But the other ten were gone, right? And one was dead. Being Judas. Oh, amen now. And so obviously then. The enemies of the Lord place their own soldiers there to make sure. See, the problem with Jesus' enemies, they knew Psalm 16, 8, verse 11. A lot of people didn't know that. They knew that the Messiah would get up. So they want to make sure it didn't happen. But God was more powerful than him. Huh? Because the Bible says that an earthquake showed up. Huh? And all the terror all around made the soldiers fall out. It made them faint. And the Bible says what? Jesus ended up doing what? Walking out of that tomb. Yeah. On the third day, not because of the intervention of man, but because of the intervention of what? God. Because why? Psalm 16 said what? Jesus was talking to the Father that you won't let my body stay in the grave. So guess who did it? God all by himself. Oh, amen, somebody. If God want to spring you, he can spring you from anything, can't you? Huh? And God can do it all by himself. Huh? A doctor can give up, but if God want to spring you from anything, can't nothing hold you. Uh oh, amen, somebody. If man want to keep talking about you and depress you, can't God give you joy and spring you from that? All on his own? Oh, amen, somebody. I don't know if anybody believes in here. Like I believe in God, but anybody believe in here today. Yes, you see, folks, again, several miracles had to happen, which were nothing but God at work for yes, Jesus to get out of that tomb. Yes, you see, again, an earthquake where a supernatural angel rolled away the large stone and made the guards faint due to their tremendous fear. You see that in Matthew 28, verse 4 and verse 16. The greatest of these miracles was his lifeless body coming back to life by the power of Almighty God. You see, Jesus lives today as he ascended into heaven after being on earth with the disciples for 40 days after his resurrection. You see that documented in Acts chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 11. Lastly, the Bible tells us that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. Look at Matthew, excuse me, Mark, Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2. As we shortly come to a close, Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, talks about where Jesus would, would be born. Hundreds of years before he was born that manger. The Bible says, but thou Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in where? In Israel, whose goings forth have been from what? Of old, from what? Everlasting. In other words, he's existed uh, from the very beginning and always will exist. Can't nobody do that but somebody that's divine. Amen. Being Jesus Christ. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. So now, the Bible is saying what? Where would he be born? In what? Bethlehem. Hell. Oh, amen now. And we see that documented thoroughly 
that he was famously born in the manger in Bethlehem in Luke chapter number 2. Now lastly, we must ask the question, if Jesus is not the Messiah, which means Lord and Savior, promised from the beginning of time, then who is? God gave us the profile of the Messiah in summary as follows. Characteristic one, which this all just came from the scripture you just read. Characteristic one, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Jesus was certainly born in Bethlehem. Right, Characteristic number two, the Savior would be the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. God said it himself in John 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. And that subject is nobody but Jesus. Right. Characteristic number three, the Savior would be crucified. Jesus was nailed to the cross of Calvary. Right. Characteristic number four, the Savior would rise from the dead. Jesus is certainly risen to this day. Amen. Characteristic number five, finally, the Savior would appear when Israel would be stripped of its kings. Jesus lived in a time when the Roman emperor Caesar was in power, not a Jewish king. So this brings us to the question. Since all evidence points to Jesus as the Savior alone, why haven't you come to him for salvation? There is no other Savior who will be provided. We can only make it into heaven by hanging on the coattails of Jesus. In Jesus only. How do we know that? Because the Bible bluntly says it. When you look at Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible testifies specifically about Jesus. It says, neither... Is there salvation in any other? For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Oh, amen, somebody. There's only one way, one truth, and the life. Jesus said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming up to the Father but by me. We just saw in Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. The Holy Spirit also said the same thing. That only Jesus will bring us through those pearly gates of heaven Amen. and allow us to walk down the streets of God. Amen. So if you believe that he's a Savior, you've got to do what the Savior says. Amen. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to verse number 3, that in these last days, God speaks to us through his Son, Amen. Jesus Christ. And you are saying in your heart right now that Jesus is the Son of God. So what does it take now for me to be saved? Well, you see, if you're not saved right now, you ought to be doing just like those folks that heard the gospel in Acts chapter number 2. Yes, After they heard about the death, burial, resurrection, that Jesus is the Son of God, that suffered, died, and rose again for their salvation. Right. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Yes, sir. Well, God answered that question. He, he calls it the plan of salvation. Man. You'll see that it's the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ suffered, died, and rose again. That you may not have to answer for your own sins. You see, I don't know about you, but hopefully you're humble enough to say in your heart, I need a Savior. Right. Because the Bible tells us we all need a Savior. Yeah. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 says that all have sinned yeah. and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says what we have earned. The wages of sin is what? Is yeah. death. That's talking about hell, y'all. Mm -hmm. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal yeah. life through Christ Jesus. So let's ask the Savior. Let's ask the one foretold way back in all these scriptures of the Old Testament what we must do to be saved. Amen. Well, Jesus tells us this. He said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. sins. So you've got to li literally believe. We just talked about that. Uh, John 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a foundation. But you have to build on it. What I mean by that, that you can't end right there. Because Jesus said more than just that. He also said that you have to repent of your sins. In other words, he wants you committed to him up front. Repentance means that you're uh, desiring and following through on the fact that I want to live righteously and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. It means to turn your back on sin 
in order to obey God instead. It's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse number 5. Again, this is the Savior speaking. He says, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You can't stop there. It's good. Excellent. I commend you for your faith in Jesus, for your commitment to live righteously. In other words, to repent. But Jesus said a couple more, three more things, actually, to get it right. He also said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, as I paraphrase it, it's, uh, you have to confess him before men, and he will confess you before his Father in heaven. What he means is that you have to make it publicly known that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, yes, which means you're Lord and Savior. Yes. You come to that point, I commend you once again, because you believe right. Huh? You want to live right. Amen. You want to confess right. But you still got to obey right. Because there's another thing he said. We look at baptism. He says in Mark 16, verse 16, again, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, he binded on us that we have to show our obedience by getting in the watery grave of baptism. And that's when he decides to say, look, you see, man is saying you saved after you just believed. You don't have the authority to say that. Uh, you never fulfilled all the scriptures we just talked about. So you don't have a right to tell me nothing. Amen. You don't have a right to tell nobody anything, right? Because you're not the son of God. Huh? Some people stop at repentance. All you got to do is repent. Now you're done. No, you don't have the authority to do that. Well, just confess Christ. You don't have the authority to take anything out of the Bible. Jesus said that you have to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. And he said, after that, I want you to stay committed. I want you to continue to believe and obey me to the end of your life. And then I'm going to give you eternal life. He said, he makes that known in Revelation 2, verse number 10. He said, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. So very simply, God's biblical plan of salvation, the only one approved and given by heaven, is that you got to hear the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Believe the word of God, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has suffered, died, and rose again, that you may have a chance at eternal life. John 3, verse 16. You have to repent of your sins. sins. Step number three, Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5. You have to confess Jesus with your mouth that he is your Lord, meaning the Son of God. Amen. You have to be baptized, step number five, in the water grave of baptism, where you go down your old self or rise a new creation, where all your sins will be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ, and he will save you if you stay faithful unto death, which is part number six of the plan of salvation. Why don't you go up there? I'm talking about at the judgment day. Why don't you go there with the guarantee of the word of God and the word of God only? Amen. You can't take somebody's commentary up there. Nope. It won't reach you. Because oh, the Bible says that this word is going to be destroyed by fire. <laughs> so the works of men, now you're going to make it to the judgment day. Amen. Huh? That means, can I, can I name some names here? Y'all are right there. Amen. That means Charles Spurgeon's work ain't going to get you Amen. there. Huh? That means that, that John Wesley's work not going to get you there. Right. Charles Tad Russell's work right. is not going to get you there. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. Adam Clark's work <laughs> is not going to get you there. Right. Oh, amen. Y'all saying amen, but you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. What I mean by that, I just named the Baptist church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just named the Methodist church. Yeah. I'm going to put Martin Luther in there. That's the Lutheran church. Yeah. Huh? We're not going to talk about all the popes. <laughs> that ain't going to get you there. Oh, amen. I ain't been there, y'all. I'm just telling you that Satan has been lying to folk for a long time. Amen. And just because it's a well-crafted lie that's been told for centuries does not make it right. Amen. It just means it's a long-standing lie amen. that people have believed. Huh? Obviously, then, when you look at Romans 16, verse number 16, the Bible says, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. You found Christ's church. Now what are you going to do about it? 
This is the place of salvation. Amen. You see that in Ephesians 5, verse number 23, that God says what? The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the what? The savior of the body. The body. Stress that. Jesus has but one body. He named the body the churches of Christ in Romans 16, verse number 16. So you go through the phone book all you want. If those names don't appear in the real phone book, the one you can really dial up God, I'm talking about the word of God, then it ain't God's church. Amen. 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 Truth is the truth now. Amen. Satan makes a counterfeit of everything. Amen. Huh? He will counterfeit everything. Think about it. I hope none of y'all got this, but I want to look at some of y'all purses. And I want to see if they're really Michael Kors. <laughs> huh? I want to see if they're brownies and all that kind of stuff. Because you can put it on the outside. But on the inside, it be a whole different thing. Y'all know y'all run around them church and those, those bags that fall apart in two weeks. Amen. Uh -huh. Got coach on it. Y'all know ain't nothing. Well, if Satan does a stat with a purse, don't you think he's he's bold enough to do it with a church? Amen. Don't you think he'll create his own churches? Yeah. It'll have Christ on the outside. Yeah. On the inside is fruit of the loom. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Same concept. That's one of the worst things Satan has ever done. I'm not a hater, I'm not all that kind of stuff, but I do have to tell you the truth whether we want to hear it or not. Otherwise, I'm not worth my salt as a preacher. If I'm, not, if I'm scared to tell the truth, even if it make enemies. Didn't my hero Paul say that? Am I your enemy because I what? Tell you the, the truth? You ought to love me for telling the truth. I'd rather have my friend tell me if I'm going out somewhere, you look a hot mess right now. Then just let me walk out of the house with my hair all over the place. All right? Huh? Stinking. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> tell me the truth. Huh? Because it's only going to benefit me. Huh? Amen. I'm human. I might get mad at you for a minute, but if I realize I do one of you, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Let me catch you in about 50 minutes, man. I'll be right on back. I'm going to appreciate you. <laughs> oh, amen. Now, I know it's a silly way of saying some very serious things, but you got to give your life in truth to the Lord. Huh? The only thing that's going to set you free is the truth. Yes. Right? Come on out of that denominational stuff. Come on out of your opinions, all that kind of stuff. It's not going to save you. Amen. You don't want to be standing on quicksand Amen. when the truth is your foundation. Amen. One's going to kill you, one's going to save you. Amen. And you've heard the truth this, this afternoon. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to sing a song of invitation. That gives you an opportunity to come, out, come down the aisle, out of your seat. We're going to take your confession this afternoon, right now. And we're going to baptize you right now. Yeah. That way you can leave here with the right Mentality, meaning you can leave here with a right conscience, yes, knowing that you have done everything God has told you to do. And I guarantee you, God is not a liar, and he will not let you down. Amen. If you're a child of God also, we've got to be concerned about you. You know that you still serve a, a grace and mercy God. That is, if you have done something wrong, he'll allow you to get back in his fold by repentance, confession, and prayer. You see that in Acts 8, 22 and 1 John 1, 7, verse number 10. Won't you come now? As a designated brother will lead us in that song of invitation. Won't you please?